Okay, so folks, thus far, uh, we have been able to discuss Thomas Hobbes. We have looked at John Locke, and now we're going to look at uh, a second giant uh, as far as classical liberal philosophy is concerned. And we're going to talk about a man by the name of Baron de Montesquieu, and generally we just call him Montesquieu, okay? So if we are sort of dichotomizing what we've seen so far, Thomas Hobbes is all by himself in classical conservative land, and then we have John Locke and now Montesquieu together in classical liberalism land. Let's move on. All right, so uh, Montesquieu, what should we know about him? Sorry, let me just move my little thing up. Okay, um, so he strongly criticized absolute monarchy when it was a voice for democracy. So guys, again, as I just said, if he criticized absolute monarchy, then he was not a classical conservative. And if he's a voice for democracy, we would argue that he was a liberal. And of course, he wrote back in the 1600s, and that would make him a classical liberal, right? Because we're talking about liberalism way, way back in the day. And remember, guys, again, reminder, when we talk liberalism here, we're talking about the idea of freedom, right? This idea of freedom. Now, one huge, huge, huge contribution that Montesquieu gave to us as far as um, political thinking uh, and philosophy of government is this idea of separation of powers. Now guys, the entire point of separation of powers is to prevent tyranny. Right, it's to prevent tyranny. So you maybe wanna write that down. So separation of powers is to prevent tyranny. And he said that the best way to protect liberty, our freedoms, individual rights, was to divide powers of government into three different branches. Now, when we say branches, we're not talking about levels of government, like your civic government, your provincial government, and then your federal government. We're talking about within each government, a provincial, I guess, or a federal government, uh, because here in Canada, uh, our civic governments don't have um, a judicial branch, right? But let, let's just, for the sake of simplicity, talk about like federal governments. So what Montesquieu proposed is this three-part model where we basically have uh, an executive, a legislative, and a judicial branch, right? So executive, legislative, and judicial branch. And they each act as a system of checks and balances on each other. They both have specific powers that they have and they're both able to check each one of these stories is able to check the power of the other two and we'll look at this model in a little bit more detail here in a second um and uh we'll talk about it in a bit more detail so um checks and balances so guys again the whole point here separation of powers and checks and balances and they're like two sides of the same coin right they're two sides of the same coin trying to prevent tyranny now what of this checks and balances thing. So the whole point is to uh, ensure basically guys, I mean, if there's three parts and power is represented by 100%, right? Each branch of government would get like 33 and one third as far as the power is concerned. Now I'm just doing this for you mathematically minded people, right? Uh, but guys, basically no one branch is more powerful than another. The entire point of all this is to, is to ensure that no one person in government can become all-powerful, to ensure that whatever decisions are made in government, they're in the best interest of the people, right? And guys, that's what checks and balances is all about. So it says each branch of government would check or limit the power of the other two branches. Thus, power would be balanced, it would be even, and no one branch would become too powerful. Why? Because again, guys, when one group becomes too powerful, what we get, again, is this idea of tyranny. So it's almost like these classical liberal philosophers were paranoid with 
tyrannical government. And why would that be? Well, the reason for that, folks, would be because that's what they experienced. That's what they came from. So when they were starting to come up with their philosophies, right, people like John Locke, people like Montesquieu, they wanted to ensure that individual rights and freedoms were paramount or the most important and that, you know, the power of government was secondary to the power of the people. So as it says, guys, all this was focused to prevent tyranny. And yeah, they were paranoid about tyranny. Why? Because it's all they ever saw. Let's keep going. All right. So checks and balances. So within uh, this three-part model of governance, each branch of government has a different job. Now, is it important for you to know what each branch does? Uh, yeah, I would argue it is, right? And guys, here in Canada, we follow this model. In the United States of America, this model is followed in totalitarian states like, let's say, North Korea or Venezuela. There is no checks and balances. There is no separation of powers. They might act like they have a independent judiciary, right, which we'll talk about here in a second, but they really don't. So let's look at the job that each one of these different um, branches of government plays. So, and guys, these are in no order of importance, right? I could put executive first, judicial second, and legislative third. And when you see that model that I'm talking about here, when we look at it on the next page, um, you'll see that, uh, you know, it's a triangle, right? And in a triangle, they're all sort of like even as far as their parts. So in no order, of, no order of importance, here is the first branch of government. And that is the legislative branch. Now, when I hear the word legislative, I think of legislation. I think of the idea of creating laws. And generally, guys, that is what the power of a legislative branch of government is. Um, in the United States of America, the legislative branch of government is called Congress, right? And we're talking about the House of Representatives. There are 435 of them. And then the Senate, of which there's 100 senators, okay? So uh, here in Canada, guys, our legislative branch is the House of Commons, Okay, the House of Commons at the federal level. Generally, they're focused on laws, right? Their job, their daily job is to make laws which, I should say laws, represent, there we go, which represent the will of the people, which in a democracy is very, very important. Now, second branch, again, it's not number two because it's the second most important. It's just how we're doing this list, okay? The second uh, branch of government is known as the executive branch. Uh, and the job of the executive branch is to administer and implement policies and laws enacted by the legislative branch. And when we talk about the legislative branch of the United States, generally we think of the president and the vice president. Here in Canada, guys, the executive branch is a little bit more complicated. Uh, it is the prime minister, his cabinet, and then all the other people that make up the uh, prime minister's office, right? But anyways, let's not get too bogged down here. Um, so their job, guys, again, is to, um, uh, I would argue, enact laws, right? And let's just put create. And then lastly, we have the judicial branch. And I will say, guys, that uh, this idea of a judicial branch is probably the most important branch in any well-functioning democracy. And there is an asterisk beside it for that reason. I put an asterisk there because I would argue it is the most important. Every country in the world has a body that make laws, a legislative branch. Every government in the world has you know, these people who sort of uh, enact the laws and do the day-to-day -day administration of government, right, called the executive branch. But not every nation in the world has a legislative branch, which is independent, right? And that is the most important, right? I'm just going to try to write that independent. So we want our judicial branch of government to be independent. Now, the question is why? Well, think about this for a sec. Think about, let's say, North Korea, okay? In North Korea, guys, what Kim Jong-un says, right, as the executive, 
goes. That's it. So they might have a court system where they're supposed to be due process, rule of law, all those things that we talked about, right? Things that are supposed to be important aspects of any judicial branch of government. However, however, um, if Kim Jong-un says an individual is guilty, that person is guilty. The judicial branch is basically just a reflection of what the executive branch wants. Now here in Canada, that is not the case. That is not the case. As one of the branches of government, the job of the judicial branch of government is to ensure that the constitution and our laws are adhered to. So the job of the judicial branch is to interpret laws relative to the constitution and enforce punishment when law is broken. So making up the judicial branch, I mean the main sort of the big court in Canada is something called the Supreme Court of Canada, right? The United States has a Supreme Court, uh, France has one, right? I don't know if they call it the Supreme Court or not, Germany does, right? But any well-functioning democracy will have independent courts. So again, an independent judiciary is the most important part. And guys, a really quick way to tell if a nation is a dictatorship or democracy is to look at their judicial system. Do judges truly have the ability to rule based on being impartial and also following the law or are they simply a reflection of what powerful people in government want? If the judicial branch is simply a kangaroo court that follows uh, only what the executive branch wants, then it is not a nation that follows this Montesquieuian model of checks and balances. So all nations, as I mentioned, have an executive branch and a legislative branch, right? We all have a president, prime minister, a group of people who make laws like in the legislative branch, but not all nations have an independent judiciary. If you were to go to Venezuela or Cuba, right, they do not have an independent judiciary, right? The courts are simply an extension of the party in power, and that can be dangerous because then people are found guilty not because they are guilty but because the government doesn't like them okay okay now um you should check out this video please make sure right you'll have a copy of this uh make sure you check out this video guys it's the videos that really uh sort of make things rich and help us understand things in more detail so check those videos out don't just ignore them all right so let's talk Canada versus the U.S. Because, guys, there are some important differences when it comes to the United States and also Canada as far as how we administer uh, Montesquieu's model. Okay, so it says, yes, Canada and the U.S. both use this idea of separation of powers, as do all other liberal democracies. Why? Because it works, right? I mean, why not a five-part model or a 12-part model? Well, I would argue it would probably get a little bit more complicated uh but guys i mean this model works and until something better uh is uh or evolves in our human consciousness then this is what we're going to do because man is fragile uh, and flawed i would argue there needs to be limits placed on the power of individuals in government let's face it guys i hate to kind of take this perspective but i am a bit of a hobbesian i don't really trust people that much. So I like knowing that people in government who are flawed and broken and greedy and power hungry have limits on their power, that there's checks and mechanisms in the society that ensure that they can't do whatever they want. Could you imagine if Donald Trump didn't have any checks on his power? Think about that for a second, right? Could you imagine if anyone in like, uh, you know, the president position uh, in the prime minister position, if they didn't have limits on their powers, uh, I mean, what would happen, right? It would quickly devolve into a very negative situation. Now, uh, as it says, um, comparing Canada and the U.S., because we like to think of ourselves as very similar to them, but we're not always the same as the United States of America. There's actually some major differences when it comes to uh, how the U.S. model works and how the Canadian model works. Um, so there's different um different aspects in them. So nonetheless, both countries use separation powers, again, to ensure 
tyranny does not happen to ensure that government is ruling in the best interest of the people. Something that we call, I'm going to write that down over here, something that we call responsible, that's an I, responsible government. Okay, the abbreviation I'm going to use for government is just G-O-V apostrophe T, right? We want to make sure that the government is acting in the best interest of the people. All right, so this is the American model of separation of powers. And again, I mentioned we'd see kind of this triangular idea, right? So we have our triangle right here. Um, and guys, again, the executive is no more important than the legislative or the judicial. The judicial is no more important than the executive or the legislative. And the legislative is no more important than the executive or the judicial branch. Now, what I want you guys to notice here is that in this separation of powers model, you can see how there's give and take between the executive and the legislative. They both have defined roles. And you can see how the legislative has power over the executive because the Congress in the U.S. can pass laws over the president's veto and they control the budget. But at the same time, the president can veto laws made in the Congress or in the legislative branch. Same thing between the legislative branch and the judicial branch, right? So as it says, the Senate approves. Senate is part of Congress. The president's court appointments and can remove judges. But at the same time, the legislative branch has the ability to check the power of the legislative branch because they can declare laws made in the legislative branch as unconstitutional. And then lastly, between the judicial branch and the executive branch, again, we see ebb and flow, give and take, right? Courts can declare acts by the president as unconstitutional. And alternatively, the president appoints judges in the model, okay? So there's a number of roles and rights and responsibilities that we see kind of flowing in between these different branches. And again, guys, the whole point here is to prevent tyranny. Tyranny is bad. Now, this is a Canadian model of separation or sorry of well we could call it separation of powers but generally we could call it also fusion of powers and the fusion of powers happens in that and here's the crazy thing so guys in Canada again we have a legislative branch right called Parliament or the House of Commons and you can see how right it is composed of members of Parliament and also the Senate right their job is to create legislation and then we have the executive branch which is the Governor General and the Prime Minister and his cabinet, and then also different departments under the prime minister's office. The fusion or the sort of overlap of powers occurs right here. Okay, I want you guys to understand the prime minister and his cabinet are simply members of parliament who also sit inside the House of Commons. And we don't see that in the American separation of powers. In the American separation of powers, Congress is Congress and the president is not a part of that. The vice president is not a part of that. Uh, and in Canada, right, the prime minister actually sits in our legislative branch while still being the executive or part of the executive branch of our federal government. So it's kind of a neat little difference. Uh, we call it the Westminster model. Uh, and then lastly, we have the judicial branch of government again, Supreme Courts, Courts of Appeal, District Courts, Provincial Courts, all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of similarities, but there's a few important differences. Let's keep going. So key differences between the U.S. and Canada as far as how our governments are structured. So in the American model, the president and the president alone, for the most part, is the executive branch, right? We, when we talk about the president, we talk about him having executive power. Now, the vice president also has powers delegated to him as per the American Constitution. But generally, when we think of the executive branch of government in the U.S., right, federally speaking, we think of the president of the United States. Now, here in Canada, again, the executive consists of the prime minister, who we generally kind of say is like the president of the United States, although our prime minister has way less power. Um, additionally, in Canada, the executive also consists of his cabinet uh, and also, probably most importantly, the crown, right? Which technically in Canada, our head of state, technically speaking, is the queen, right? We are still a British colony and 
when the queen is not in Canada to do her queenly duties, um, the queen is represented by the governor general. Okay, so there's a number of people in Canada that make up the executive branch, whereas in the US, generally we think of only one person being a part of the executive branch. Now, continuing, because these differences are important. Uh, in the US, the president is not a part of the legislative branch when it comes to lawmaking, right? Can the president make laws? Yes, he can. They're called executive orders, right? And he has the power to do so. Uh, but guys, here in Canada, right? So the president doesn't sit in Congress, but here in Canada, our prime minister, who's part of the executive branch, actually also sits in the legislative branch, which is kind of interesting. And uh, as a matter of fact, guys, the president cannot step foot in the House of Representatives or Congress, as it's called, as it would be seen a, as a branch of exec or a breach, sorry, of executive power, right? It would be seen as sort of undue influence on Congress. Now, does that mean that the president never visits Congress? Well, no, that is not true, right? The president can be invited to go to Congress when he gives his State of the Union addresses, but in general, the place where the president does his work is in the White House, right? That's where he does what he does. Continuing, in the US, senators, they're elected, right? We have midterm elections that happen uh, in the US, and those midterm elections are for senators and Congress people, right? And then of course, we also have presidential elections and we'll get to that later at another point in the course. So in the US, senators are elected and as a result, they have lots of legislative power. Whereas here in Canada, senators are appointed and they're appointed on the recommendation of the prime minister. So because senators are appointed and not elected, here in Canada, we generally say that senators don't have a lot of power. Why? Because they're not voted in by the people. In the US, senators are elected by the people, whereas in Canada, they're not. Because the people aren't choosing them, instead they're being chosen by someone like the prime minister. Um, the Senate generally in Canada doesn't originate legislation. They generally don't try to stop legislation. They might make recommendations and stuff like that. But when we think of the Senate here in Canada, we generally think of it as sort of a rubber stamp, right? If it's passed through the, uh, the House of Commons, then it, when it gets into the Senate, it's just kind of a rubber stamp and it moves on for uh, royal assent, it's called. Um, continuing in the U.S., Presidential elections are scheduled, right? Presidential elections happen on the first Tuesday of November every fourth year. We, in fact, could look at a calendar right now and know exactly when the next presidential election is. Let me just go into my phone right here uh, and look at, let's go to November. First Tuesday of November is November 3rd. So on November 3rd, boop, 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 right there, right? Not very good. On November 3rd, 2020, the next American presiden presidential election happens, right? These are scheduled, right? Every fourth year, first Tuesday of November. Uh, and in Canada, guys, um, elections must happen within five years of the last one, right? There's a section in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms that talks about how we must have or no parliament shall sit for longer than five years, okay? Um, but can they happen earlier? Absolutely, right? Sometimes governments here in Canada, because of the way our government works, um, sometimes you have elections, you know, uh, in three years since the last one or four years, uh, but they're not a fixed thing. In the U.S., the president has veto power. Any of you gamers out there, right, if you play... Uh, you know, uh, Halo or Call of Duty, right? You know about veto power when it comes to video games, right? You know, like the map that's being selected for the online game, right? You can click X or whatever it is to try to not have that map happen. If enough people don't want it, then you go to a different map, okay? Anyways, guys, in the US, veto power means the president can actually strike down uh, or nullify a law that was created in the legislative branch, in the Congress. Whereas here in Canada, folks, no such veto power exists for the prime minister. So again, 
I said this already, I'll say it again. The president in the United States, because of like veto power and because of executive orders, which we've looked at already in this course, the president of the United States has a lot more power in terms of his role uh, in the executive branch. Um, and then, yeah, guys, when comparing the American and the Canadian system of checks and balances and separation of powers, I would argue that there's more uh, mechanisms or systems in the American federal government to check power than in the Canadian government. Now, why would that be? Well, let's think about this for a sec. Uh, I love Canada, but Canada was founded uh, by basically deserters leaving the United States when the U.S. was talking about having a revolution against their king, right? They're called United Empire Loyalists. Um, so the first Canadians really were Americans who left America that wanted to remain loyal to the British crown and wanted nothing to do with the American Revolution, right? Um, whereas um, Americans, right, like America itself as a country was born from revolution. It was born against tyranny. So as a result, guys, um, to say that Americans are like pretty paranoid about uh, the idea of tyranny is a fairly uh, accurate thing to say. All right. So, um, yeah, Montesquieu, uh, what should we know about him? Um, yeah, he said the best government was one which is a republic. When we think of Republican governments, we think of rule of the people, by the people, for the people. And again, we think of limited government, right? We think of limited government. Um, book that he wrote was called The Spirit of Laws. I've never seen any questions about that on the diploma exam, but it's not necessarily a bad thing to know. Um, he said that a democratic republic was strong only if it had mechanisms to maintain a proper balance of power. And remember, guys, again, I'll say it again and again and again. The po whole point here is to prevent tyranny. Um, and this separation of powers idea, when the American forefathers were sitting down uh, and starting to write their constitution after the American War of Independence, um, once they were successful in defeating the British, uh, Montesquieu's ideas of separation of powers and checks and balances were heavily borrowed from. So John Locke, right, and his idea of like natural laws natural rights, life, liberty, property, rebel against government, replace with one that is uh, protecting our natural rights. I, Locke is a juggernaut as far as like political philosophy and his contributions to the creation of the first great experiment in classical liberalism. Well, guess what? Montesquieu is as well. When James Madison was writing the U.S. Constitution uh, in Philadelphia, he uh, he heavily bored from the ideas of Montesquieu. So that's the man, right? That's the man. So he said balance of powers to limit government, right? Checks and balances to limit government. Separate powers as a form of checks and balances to ensure that no one person can become all powerful. Good Lord, that was a lot. Okay, I apologize, but man, I get excited. I get excited when I talk about government and stuff like that, so I can't help myself. I can't help myself that I'm a bit of a dork when it comes to that, but whatever. You got to be passionate about something, right? Two things I really like. Number one, social studies. Number two, pizza. Anyways, uh, as always, guys, I love you. I'll talk to you guys later. Okay, peace. Take it easy.